This lecture is on hemodynamic basics. In order to understand hemodynamics, we must first start with the circulation of blood in the body. Deoxygenated blood enters the right atrium through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Once in the right atrium, it passes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it passes through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery, which bifurcates out to the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. The pulmonary arteries carry the blood to the right lung and the left lung, where simple diffusion occurs to get rid of CO2 and bring oxygen into the blood vessels. So once the blood vessels have oxygenated blood, it is now arterialized blood. The arterialized blood comes back to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins. Once it's in the left atrium, it will pass through the mitral valve, which is also known as the back cuspid valve, into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it passes through the aortic valve into the ascending aorta and into the aortic arch. In the aortic arch, blood will leave the aortic arch and head to the upper portions of the body, such as the head, the chest, and the arms. And the rest of the blood will continue down through the descending aorta, which will carry blood to the abdominal regions and the legs. Once it drops off oxygen at the tissue levels, it picks up carbon dioxide and the deoxygenated blood returns back to the right atrium. Let's look at a couple of definitions. The systolic pressure is the highest pressure of the cardiac system. The diastolic pressure is when the heart is at rest between beats. Automaticity is the ability of cardiac cells to spontaneously depolarize without stimulation. So this brings us to our cardiac conduction system. We start with the sinoatrial node, which is also called the SA node. This is our normal pacer. The, it paces the heart at 60 to 100 beats per minute. Our backup pacer is known as the atrioventricular node or the AV node. It paces the heart at 40 to 60 beats per minute. There's a slight delay between the SA node and the AV node, and that is to allow time for the ventricles to fill with blood. After that, the electrical current moves through the left and right bundle branches, out through the Purkinje fibers rather rapidly to contract the ventricles and push blood out to the body. Next, we'll talk about cardiac output. Cardiac output is the total amount of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle per minute. It is directly related to three components, the preload, the afterload, and the contractility. Contractility is the forcefulness of the heart muscle contracting under a constant load. Preload is the pressure that stretches the ventricle walls prior to a ventricular contraction. And this is related to ventricular filling. So what affects preload? So increases in preload. This can be caused by an increase in venous return. Venous return is the deoxygenated blood that returns back to the right side of the heart. That is venous return. So an increase in venous return can increase right ventricular end diastolic pressure as well as an increase in right ventricular end diastolic volume. This increases the stretch of the ventricle, which means that we have an increase in preload. Also, an increase in ventricular compliance means that we have a greater expansion of the ventricle, and this means that we have an increase in filling of the ventricle. This as well increases preload.
that brings us to Frank Starlin mechanism. This refers to changes in venous return. If we have an increase in filling of the ventricles, this changes the force of contraction. And in turn, this changes stroke volume. Preload is decreased by hypovolemia. Hypovolemia means that we have a decrease in circulating blood volume. This means that there's not as much blood that will enter into the ventricles, which means there's not as much stretch. This will decrease preload. An increase in heart rate will decrease preload, and that is because an increase in heart rate does not allow for enough filling time of the ventricles. So it decreases the filling time of the ventricles, and in turn, that decreases preload. Atrial arrhythmias can decrease preload, and that is because with an atrial arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation, the blood tends to be stagnant in the right atrium, which means there's not as much blood is going to enter into the right ventricle because the right atrium is just fibrillating. It's not actually contracting. So this would decrease the preload. Next, let's talk about afterload. Afterload is the load against which the ventricles must contract to eject blood. The afterload is affected by the pulmonary vascular resistance and the systemic vascular resistance. An increase in pulmonary pressures in the vascular system will increase the afterload of the right ventricle. A decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance or a decrease in the pulmonary vascular pressures will decrease the afterload of the right ventricle. The left ventricle is affected by the systemic vascular resistance. So an increase in vascular pressure in the systemic system will increase our uh, afterload of the left ventricle. If we give a vasodilator, that means that we're dilating out the vascular, the systemic vascular system. This is going to cause a decrease in systemic vascular resistance, which in turn will decrease the afterload. Indirectly, cardiac output is affected by these two components, heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected out of the ventricle with each contraction. Normal is around 50 to 100 milliliters per contraction. Every time the ventricle contracts, not all the blood is ejected out of the ventricle. Only a percentage of it is ejected out. That is called the ejection fraction. Normal ejection fraction is 60 to 75 percent. So with each contraction, only 60 to 75 percent of the blood is ejected out of the ventricle. Systemic vascular resistance. The normal value is 900 to 1500 dyne per second per centimeter to the negative fifth power. The systemic vascular resistance is the resistance in the systemic vascular system that the left ventricle has to pump against when it contracts. The pulmonary vascular resistance is normal value 100 to 250 dyne per second per centimeter to the negative fifth power. Pulmonary vascular resistance is the resistance in the pulmonary vascular system in which the right ventricle has to pump against when it contracts. Normal central venous pressure is 2 to 6 millimeters of mercury. That is a representation of our right atrial pressure. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, normal value is 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury. You may also hear it referenced as the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. The only way to obtain the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is to have a pulmonary artery catheter uh, 
placed in the heart. This allows us to wedge a balloon in the pulmonary artery, which allows us to determine what the pressure is of the left atrium. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a reflection of left atrial pressures. With congestive heart failure, we will see increases in that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We have two different types of pulmonary edema, cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema is related to congestive heart failure. One of the tools that you can use to determine whether it is cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic is to do a wedge pressure. If it is considered cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the wedge pressure will be elevated at 18 millimeters of mercury or more. That's an indication of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that is related to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That ends this presentation on hemodynamic basics.